This day, the 23rd day of February 1807, sees the 10th reading of the Slave Trade Bill. determined to forget my fears as my cause will bear me out. Honourable members, I ask you to support me as I seek the total abolition of the slave trade. Have you considered how your coffee and sugar, your uh, Rum and tobacco reaches our country? Well, by sea, sir, across the North Atlantic, from the Americas and the Caribbean. Uh, true, but at what cost? Well, we pay good money for it, sir, and we import, import rice and cotton from there as well. We do. Having exported ammunition and guns, uh, glass and pots, copper and cloth, to West Africa, but at what price? A, a fair price, sir, the going rate. <laughs> the price of human lives. Africans enslaved against their will, degraded, denied every human right, and shipped across the South Atlantic to labor all the hours that God sends upon the plantations, our plantations, to produce, well, our coffee and sugar, our, our rum and tobacco. But uh, is the Honorable Member for Kingston upon Hull and Yorkshire pointing his finger accusingly across the chamber? Nay, nay, sir, across the Pennines, at those of us representing the interests of Lancashire and Liverpool. My right honourable friend, the member for Liverpool, must accept his share of the blame. However, I mean not to accuse just the merchants of Lancaster and Liverpool, but to take my own share of the shame upon myself and indeed upon the whole of the Parliament of Great Britain for allowing this horrid trade to continue under our authority. But I suspect, sir, that you infer that one political party, we Tories, must bear more guilt than the others. Mm. I speak as an independent member of Parliament. This is not a matter of party politics. I speak as a humble member of the human race <laughs> on behalf of fellow human beings. Indeed, I appeal to your humanity. Six or seven hundred Negroes stowed into each ship that sails from West Africa with our blessing and for our profit uh, across the Atlantic Ocean to the West Indies, chained together in pairs, two 
and two, crowded in the hold of a vessel, diseased and distressed. Where is their dignity? Have we not the courage to recognize man's inhumanity to man? Have we not the sensibility to hear as each slave silently pleads, am I not a man and a brother? Mm. I, I bring before the house, Mr. Speaker, four exhibits. Exhibit A, a pair of leg irons. A pair of leg irons. Exhibit B, a neck brace. A neck brace. Exhibit C, a punishment collar. A punishment collar. Exhibit D, a whip. A whip. Is this the way to treat our fellow human beings? Mr. Speaker, the irons are used necessarily. The slaves' apartments on board ship are, are fitted up to their advantages. Uh, circumstances will admit. Uh, the left ankle of one is, is fastened to the right ankle of another with a, a small iron fetter, and if they are turbulent or troublesome, by another to their wrists. Uh, why, in a storm, they might roll over and crush one another. Were they not chained to the floor? He admits that the freedom of movement is denied in their sleep. Can he tell the house what provision is made for their other basic human needs? Mr. Speaker, the, the, the slaves have several meals a day after the uh, manner of their own country and one by way of variety which is more to the British taste. Of course, after breakfast there's water for washing and drinking. <laughs> The washing encouraged is often only to hide the wounds of the whip. That is nonsense, Mr. Speaker. The slaves are not like you or I, I tell you. They know their place Shame. in the order of things. Shame. They are content with their lot. Um, before dinner, they are entertained after the fashion of their own country. Why? Their own song and dance is promoted. <laughs> he means that these miserable wretches loaded with chains are encouraged by the lash to dance out of the way once they have been temporarily released from their bondage. I tell you, their songs are of lamentation. They are in tears as they sing. Is this the way to treat fellow human beings? They do have feelings. Mr. Speaker, their feelings are catered for. <laughs> Their feelings are so well catered for that each slave is given a number rather than addressed by his or her name. The numbers, sir, are for accountancy purposes. We have their interests at heart. Indeed, they're being introduced to Christianity. And though many on the plantations, once they arrive, are denied the opportunity to attend church on a Sunday, I believe. They're offered every means of civilization. Once they reach the plantation, sir, if I may read, I have a statement uh, from Mr. W. Knox, which proves my point. 
I never did consider it lawful to purchase an African Negro, but with the sincere purpose of bettering his condition both here and hereafter, <laughs> and instructing him in the knowledge and will of his creator. Is it not the case that more than one in seven of the Negroes perish on the passage across the Atlantic, which should take eight weeks. I have the journal of Mr. John Newton, well-known slave trader, well, sir. at well. the end of one such crossing, Wednesday, 12th of June, buried a man-slave, number 84 of a fever which he had been struggling with near seven weeks. Thursday, 13th of June, the day following, you will note, buried a woman slave, number 47. Now, not what she died of, for she has not been properly alive since she first came on board. Shall I continue? Mr. Speaker, that was before we had a surgeon sail with the ships. Ah. Now the death numbers are markedly reduced. Yes, well, more die on shore before the day of their sail to the owners of the plantations. More die when they begin the harvesting of the sugar cane. I mean, how can the right honourable member sit there and justify the tyranny, the oppression of a human trade that exists in order to satisfy his sweet tooth and his bank balance. Mr. Speaker, not just mine. Does the right honourable member know how much sugar is consumed in Britain? Not, uh, not 10,000 tonnes as it was a century ago. No, sir. 80,000 tonnes per annum. Well, not stop it, sir. We love our sugar. <laughs> I cannot argue with the figures, Mr. Speaker. I do know that the Indulgence in sugar in this country is immense. But every pound of sugar you buy is stained with innocent blood. And we love our tobacco, our rum, and our coffee. <clears throat> and we need slaves to produce these commodities at a reasonable price. I tell you, I tell you, the slave trade is an evil trade. I will not rest until I have effected its abolition. Britain's sweet taste of success is tainted by cruelty. You see, Britain's imperialism her lust for power, her pride in conquest, her sordid avarice is accomplished only by this cruelty. We derive wealth from this horrid trafficking. I tell you, it must stop. <sighs> Will you listen to the right honourable member for Kingston upon Hull, the sanctimonious nightingale of the Commons? Well, he may have a melodious voice, but we must not be seduced by his raptures or mesmerised by his rhetoric. This bill has failed nine times before. Shame. And it will fail again. We cannot afford it. <laughs> I speak not only on behalf of the merchants of Liverpool, but everybody when I say that the might of Britain, 
the security of Britain, the strength of her navy and the permanence of her manufactures depends upon continued trade with our colonies in the West Indies and thus the slave trade. The right honourable gentleman does not speak for me. Is it not the case that he has business interests of his own connected with the slave trade, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I do not deny it, but that is hardly the point. Would the right honourable member have ourselves work out in the tropical sun? We cannot labour all day in the plantations in the scorching heat. The Negroes can. Their skin resists the sun's scorching shame rays. On you, sir. Shame on you. Mr. Speaker, if you succeed in banning the British slave trade, then you will simply be opening the way to other European nations to profit by our mistakes. Mm. You'll simply be playing into the hands of the French. Yeah. Do, do you want a revolution over here too? I'm defending the livelihoods not only of myself and the planters and creditors of the sugar colonies re resident in Liverpool. Listen to him. But also the rope makers, the sail makers, shipwrights, joiners, carpenters, gun makers, block makers, candlestick makers, butchers and bakers of Liverpool. Our economy depends upon the trades in sugar tobacco and rum. It's an integral part of the empire's business. We need slaves. No. I further believe, my right honourable friends, that no plan of ab abolition should be continued until a sufficient fund has been established to pay adequate compensation to any businessman who suffers financial loss. There we have his true colours, Mr Speaker. I'm sure I speak for my learned and nautical friends in London and Bristol in this matter also. You do not speak for the people of Kingston upon Hull. You do not speak for the people of Yorkshire. You do not speak for anyone who has an ounce of compassion. Indeed, you do not speak for the country if oh. I have the will of the people behind me and I believe at long last I have. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, a question to the right honourable member, if I may. Uh, sir, is not Henry Lassells, a Yorkshireman. I have the figures here. The Lassells family owns 18 plantations, a share in a further 29, a total of 9,000 acres, sir. The splendour of the Lassells stately home, now known as Harwood House in Yorkshire, and its vast estate is built and bought on the profits of sugar and the toil and sweat of African slaves. You cannot, sir, simply accuse us Lancastrians. This is not a war of the roses, but a debate about making Britain great. And I make no apology for my part in that. Well, shame on you, sir. The rose of Lancashire, I tell you, is red with innocent blood. Faults are portrayed by fanatics cloud the public mind of the truth. There have been many stories fabricated of cruelty, treachery and murder. The fact is that the enslaved Negroes are brought out from a dark continent of tyranny and slavery to a new world of civilised servitude. I have it on good authority. Good authority, Mr. Speaker, that many are kidnapped against their will. Delivered from nakedness to comfortable clothing and from a state Shame. where they have nothing to one where their lives and their property are under the strong and sacred protection of British law. Why, sir, 
on passage from their own country to the West Indies. They're treated better than our convicts transported to Australia. Better even, sir, than our own soldiers on campaign. <laughs> except, except for their chains. Hand and foot passed to the floor. Treated with humane Well nourished. Ah, well nourished. Forced, fed, or flogged. Every, every caretaker that they fall sick. I tell you, they are content and cheerful on board ship. <laughs> In the words of Aulanda oh. Equiano, a former slave, and indeed a well-known abolitionist. No. From his own experience, I feared I should be put to death. The white masters looked and acted in such a savage manner. I had never seen among any people such instances of brutality. On refusing to eat, one held me fast by the hands, one tied my feet, and the other flogged me severely. I would have jumped over the side if I could. But, Mr. Speaker, on arrival in the colonies, they expressed great delight at seeing more of their own kind. <laughs> Roped together, parceled up like so many sheep in a fold. And then inspected by prospective buyers. Sold to the highest bidder. Then branded like cattle with a flesh scorching iron rod with the initials of their new master. Mr. Speaker, I have yet heard of a single instance of a slave wishing to return to his own country. Uh, really? I have with me somewhere here the Royal oh. Gazette. Gazette. Kingston, Jamaica, June 16th. Run away from the subscriber, a short black fellow marked, marked WB on his right shoulder. Formerly the property of Mr. Philip Reed of Kingston, reward Reed? five pounds. Indeed, sir. July 8th. Run away, a Negro man, about my height, five feet five inches high, stout made, but marked R.S. On both cheeks. Formerly the property of Mr. Richard Simmons of Kingston, Jamaica. Reward £10. Need I continue? Mr. Speaker, the slaves are better off in the colonies than they ever were in Africa. <laughs> if I may crave the house indulgence and give you a little example, a friend of mine, Mr. Farah, recently returned from a trip to West Africa. There he was forced to witness a number of savage ceremonies before being conveyed to the royal palace, a mud hut. Over the door were a number of severed heads at which the birds of prey were pecking. Mr. Pharaoh was informed that not a week before his visit there had been a slaughter of some 500 men, women, and children. And a custom sacrificed by the king to appease his ancestors in the afterlife. I tell you, 
the transatlantic slave trade preserves lives that would otherwise be forfeit. Oh, Negroes are delighted nonsense. to be bought out of slavery in their own country. Oh, like the Negro who upon his arrival in Barbados was beaten so badly that his bones were broken for letting the pot that he was heating on the fire boil over. Well, no doubt, sir, he's still alive. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the most abject state of slavery in the islands of Jamaica, Barbados or Antigua, is an infinitely preferable state to the best and most favoured slaves in Africa. From my knowledge of the barbarity of Africa at large, I say to you, for the sake of humanity, the slave trade must continue. <laughs> Hark! The slaves are brought from a state at which human nature revolts <laughs> to one which is as comfortable and civilised as that of the labouring poor of England. Oh, no, listen to him, listen to him. Hark! Thank you, Mr Speaker, at his false concerns for mankind. I tell you, his only concern is a commercial concern. Oh, dare you, sir. He prolongs the agony of an enslaved workforce in order to line his own pockets, those of his family, and those of his constituents. I tell you, in the words of Mr. Equiano, is it surprising that many of us attempt to take our own lives and seek a refuge in death away from those who render our lives intolerable. Mr. Speaker, would you believe the tales of a slave against the word of a gentleman oh, imparted under oath to the House of Lords? Uh, if this pernicious bill is passed, the revenue of Britain will lose millions of pounds and the Navy thousands of men. The facts are these. The Port of Liverpool alone invests six to seven million pounds a year in the slave trade and employs 140 to 150 sale of ships in that same trade. The continued importation of Negro slaves from Africa is the only possible means for the continued cultivation of the colonies and the prosperity of our great kingdom. Uh, thank you. This is a, this as you see, Mr. Speaker, is recognized as a plain statement plainly set forth and grounded in the truth. <laughs> A spirited, though misguided, performance. I conclude with just three plain questions. Can a slave marry without his owner's permission? Presuming that he had it, then can a slave refuse to flog his own wife? with her person all exposed, if his owner pleases to command him. Can a slave with his own power stop his own wife or child being so? if his owner pleases. Every
pro-slavery petitioner will tell you that the answer to these questions is one and the same word. When any Englishman with a vested interest tells you how well treated the slaves are, tells you how happy they are, tell him that he insults your intelligence. Tell him that he outrages your British feeling. Tell him he dishonours God. Mr. Speaker, I urge all honourable members with a conscience, with all of my heart, to change the course of history. Be a friend of humanity. Freedom is the right of every human being, black and white. Vote in favour of the abolition of this abhorrent traffic in human flesh. Vote in favour of the abolition of the slave trade. Vote yes! <laughs> Mr Speaker, in conclusion, I feel I speak not only for Liverpool, but for Bristol and for London when I say that our jobs our industry and our financial security depends upon the continuation of the British slave trade. Yeah. I urge you to vote against the tender-hearted and short-sighted policies of the, of the Honourable Member for Kingston upon Hull and against this ridiculous bill. The abolitionists have been misled and misguided. Vote no! You, you know that reform only leads to revolution. Do you want to go the same way as the French? Vote no to save our sovereignty. God save the king! Vote no! Save us! Save us! Save us! Save Honourable members, this great debate has taken us through the night into the early hours of the 24th of February, 1807. A date that could go down in history as a landmark victory for humanity. Yeah, yeah. Or a date that sees the final nail in the coffin of a foolish cause. I'll say so. Human lives are at stake. Our lives are at stake.
The debate has concluded. You will now cast your votes. Gentlemen, please. You have heard the arguments on both sides. Be ruled by your conscience. Should the slave trade continue, or should the slave trade be abolished? The decision is yours. Am I not a friend? Shall speak to these citizens of From the clerk, the vote in the House at 4 a.m. on the 24th of February, 1807, is as follows. The eyes to the left, 283. The nose to the right, 16. I declare that the House of Commons has decided overwhelmingly that the British and Empire transatlantic slave trade is to be abolished. Yeah.